Uh, we're off to a great stop this morning with technology. It'll happen. Yeah, it'll happen. So uh, I'm waiting for my for the computer to start up so I can load up on our our uh, class material. And uh, so I thought maybe we would look at the video again, uh, just as a refresher. And as soon as that thing. If it's not used, then you have to download everything and update it. And we're at 55%, so by the time you see the video. But anyway, I, I have a question. Um, since we've been looking at cold case Christianity, the textbook, the textbook, the reading of the textbook is pretty interesting, I think. What do you all think? Is it too deep? <coughs> is it confusing? I would rather study the Bible. Okay. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. So she'd rather study the Bible. And so we have two agrees. So how many feel that way? Uh, All right. Truthfully. Truthfully? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. The elders will take that under advisement and uh, see what we can come up with. Uh, most of this material, and, and I have drafted a, a text to, uh, to Larry and, and Butch and Ellie and David in regards to this material. But um, I know that there is something in the works for June 5th, and uh, I have a slide about that, but uh, it's it's regarding the New Beginnings class. You know where we're going to have that class at, Larry? To be determined. Yeah. TBD, okay. <laughs> Outside. Outside, yeah. Uh, that's to be determined, but it's a New Beginnings class. It's for new converts and those who are young in the faith. And Larry's going to be teaching that class, and it'll start June 5th. So this, some of this number is going to go into that class. Whatever you feel, if, you, if you're a new convert, I think that's the class you want to go to. If you're young in the faith, if you're young in the faith, if you feel like you want to take that class, by all means, please do that. In regards to cold case Christianity, um, it follows kind of the same lines as uh, uh, the case for Christ. Maybe a little different because uh, the guy that wrote that was a journalist, an investigative journalist. Or um, tactics, the same way of, of how to talk to people in regards to that. Although uh, Gregory Coolis was not uh, an atheist. So we have the case for Christ and and uh, Cold Case Christianity, both of those authors at one point in their lives were atheists. So you're seeing a little bit of a, you know, this guy really goes into in depth because that was his, that was the way he worked. And so. Joe, I, um, I think the, the book is good. This book is good and, and the study is good. I think we spend more time on court cases than we do how it reflects on our talking with people mm -hmm. about Christianity. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. And that, that, I think, is probably dragging us down. I think we could spend less time on the court stuff. Mm -hmm. and maybe, uh, well, today's class, if I can get it going, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to cover the whole chapter. If I can get this thing open. <laughs> because the notes are there. And they're not here. Uh, and so while that is working, let's, let's go ahead and look at this one more time, and uh, we'll go from there. <coughs> Maybe. Invalid entry. There we go.
For example, John always calls Peter Simon Peter because there's so many Peters, he's trying to distinguish one from the so many Simons rather, he's trying to distinguish one from the other. But but it's clear that Mark was talking about somebody he's familiar with somebody who's very familiar to the reader. He never uses that qualifier on his name. Even more interesting, every time that Simon is described in Mark's gospel, when Peter does something embarrassing, Mark minimizes it. Mark covers for him. So if there's an embarrassing episode, I'll give you an example of this. You know when Jesus walked on water and he walked to the uh, boat with the disciples in it? Remember that episode? Well, you know what happened, right? Peter says, hey, Jesus, can I come out of the boat too? If that's really you, can I come out of the boat? It's almost like he's asking for a demonstration here. He wants to know that he gets out of the boat, right? He takes a few steps toward Jesus and he begins to sink. Pretty embarrassing. And Jesus in front of the other disciples says, Peter, you have little faith. and You didn't have enough faith to even walk on this water with me. It's got an embarrassing episode for Peter, but what's recorded twice. Matthew records it, and Mark records it. Only in Mark's version, Peter never gets out of the boat. He leaves out that detail, that embarrassing detail. There are a couple more like this, where he's more embarrassing. Peter's more embarrassing in almost every gospel except for Mark. As a matter of fact, there are times when Mark will say, the disciples said something embarrassing, when in fact, the other gospel authors will identify that it was Peter of the disciples who actually said it. Well, Mark's not going to put that in. Mark always gives you the least embarrassing view of Peter. There are lots of good reasons. I've got a diagram that shows you making the case circumstantially, as we already talked about in the last session, for why I think Peter's fingerprints are all over Mark's gospel. Just help me to take a little step to verify, to tend to kind of corroborate the claims of the gospels. But now I want to come to a, a point that I think is critical for us, because a lot of uh, educated skeptics, People like Bart Ehrman, a very well-educated biblical scholar, who's written a number of books, I've mentioned them in my book, Whole Case Christianity, making claims that he cannot, he could not trust the Gospels, given on the differences he sees in the most ancient manuscripts. Here's what I mean. You realize, of course, we don't have an original copy of any New Testament books. That's not a big deal, but it was to Bart. He didn't know, he had never heard that before he entered Moody Bible Institute. There he discovered that he did not have an original copy of any gospel. And in fact, the most ancient versions, most ancient manuscripts we have, when compared to one another, there are variations between the manuscripts. As a matter of fact, he makes a famous claim that there are more variations between the ancient manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. And that sounds pretty powerful, and for a lot of people that could be a stumbling block, right? You mean to tell me we don't have an original, and that the copies we do have are, are, are did it have some differences between those copies? As a matter of fact, you'll see in your Bible, if you hold a Bible like an ESV or a, uh, uh, an NASV, those translations have footnotes that identify the differences between the ancient copies. So how can you be sure that we have returned reliably to the inerrant original if what we're doing is recrafting a manuscript from ancient copies that have slight variations. Well, it never bothered me as an investigator, uh, as an atheist, looking at this issue, because I've entered into crime scenes for now over 25 years. When we set a crime scene, we typically use tape like this in order to mark the edges of the crime scene. You know, we'll tie it to a post. How big do you think we mark it? We don't just start at the, the crime occurred right here. I wouldn't just start at the edges of these chairs. I'd probably start at the corners of the block. I want everything for maybe half a mile out to determine, well, well how did we get here? I'm going to rope in far more than I need. And that means that inside that crime scene, there's going to be two kinds of things. There's going to be stuff that actually is related to the case, is evidence related to the actual act. That's going to be a placard like this. I'm going to put that placard down to the evidence. But there's also going to be stuff in the scene that's not evidence. It was either there before the crime. Maybe if someone was killed in this scene, uh, paramedics came in and they tried to rescue this person, and now they've got their paramedic paraphernalia all over the scene. That's not evidence related to the crime. Those are artifacts that either are there before the crime occurs or are left in the scene by, say, the paramedics who now have their packaging all over the place, and half these blood smears are from the paramedics. There are there's always evidence and artifacts in crime scenes. Evidence and artifacts. My job is to remove the artifacts so I can get back to the evidence to recreate the scene in its most pristine form. That's a skill set we use. We know how to separate artifacts from crime scenes. Well, we have a text. And you think there might be some variations, some artifacts in the text. No problem. 
The same approach we stand in crime scenes, the same approach we take in crime scenes, we can take in the biblical text to remove the artifacts to get back to the pristine, inerrant original. And how we do it is by comparing the manuscripts we have. We ask the same questions in crime scenes. Okay, well, first of all, uh, is there, is there, is there, can I identify a late entry? Look, if I see a paramedic uh, smear there, and I know the paramedics came in after the crime, I can identify that as a late entry. I can then remove it. It was not there at the time of the crime. It came in late. Okay, take it out. Uh, is there something that's just different by its very nature? When you see all the wrapping materials that don't look like they belong in the scene because they came in from the paramedic's truck, you can pretty easily remove them. They're different in terms of character. There are a number of things I've written in your participants' guide that you can take a look at. And these are the things that we look for, the nature of the artifacts that identifies them as artifacts, and then we remove them. Could you imagine if I could take a photograph of the crime scene just seconds before the crime, and then as the crime's occurring, and then a seconds after it occurred, and I could take 10 photographs, I would be able to compare the photographs to see what comes in late, to see what doesn't belong, to get back to the inerrant original. Same thing has happened in our manuscript gatherings. We have so many manuscripts that we can compare, that we can look and see where there's a variation, because it may not be in the same place in the second manuscript. So we can kind of get a sense of this. I've given you an example in your participant's guide of a dispatch call to a robbery at a 7-Eleven. Take a look at it right now. You'll see I've given you five or six versions of this call, and in each call, there's a slight variation in the way the dispatcher sends it out to the computer terminal in the radio car, in the actual police car. Yet, I don't think that those officers are going to have any problem getting to the right location for the right kind of crime with the right kind of suspect description, even though there is a variation in every single dispatch line. Well, why? Because they can actually compare all the dispatch lines and return reliably to the original intent of the dispatcher. The same thing happens in our manuscript evidence. Although there may be some variations, we can compare documents to get back to a, uh, an original reliably. Now you've got two tools to put in your bag for this session. The first is hang on every word. Look at every word seriously. Consider the optional words. Consider the compression extension of time, even as you're reading through the Gospels. And take a look at my case for Peter's involvement in the Gospel of Mark. Secondly, Learn how to separate artifacts from evidence. And don't be shaken by the fact you may have artifacts in your crime scene. Can you imagine if we got called to a crime scene and we said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. There's junk in the crime scene. No, we have responsibility to remove the artifacts to get back to the evidence. So do you. You've now got two more tools that will help you determine the truth from the Gospels. Somebody's not very happy now. <laughs> I know that's not Tommy. <laughs> hmm, let's remove the, uh, some of the evidence and see who it could be. <laughs> well, I'm really having some issues. No, today's today. your day. Don't worry about it. I'm having some issues with my computer. <laughs> you think it is? Grayson? 100% she knows. She knows the sounds. And he knows if you tell her slow enough, mom will come. All right. Um, well, that's being cantankerous. Turn to if you have your workbooks. Turn to page uh, 37. Page 37. Yeah. See, it just shuts off. I don't know what's wrong with it. No, I should. I was thinking about bringing my computer. <laughs> I was going to pull the battery out, but it has screws in it. No, we just had a new battery. Really? Oh. 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 It's doing something. It's a lie. It's a lie. Dr. Frankenstein. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's somewhat slow. <laughs> <coughs> I mean, it is really, really slow. All right, well, that's playing around. Yeah, on page.
page 37, you have that diagram. Okay, so um, Peter is described with familiarity. Now, he, he mentioned that in, uh, in the video. What did he say about Simon Peter? Yeah, how did he use it? How does Mark use it? Just Peter. Just Peter. Just Peter. Or Simon. He doesn't use them both together. Mm -hmm. It's either Simon or it's Peter. He doesn't use Simon Peter. Whereas in John's Gospel, he does. Is that computer? Mm -hmm. Peter and Mark were pretty tight. So, um, my other question is, how many of you knew that Mark's gospel was actually uh, kind of a, Mark was the scribe for Peter? How many of you knew that? All right. Where was Peter supposedly martyred? Yeah, he was martyred in Rome. All right, next question is. Let's see if it picks it up. Next question is uh, Peter is bookended. Now, he had mentioned that. In Mark's Gospel, he mentions that. Do you know what scriptures they are? Do you have any idea? So when you think of a bookend, you think of the beginning and the end. Right? So, yeah, so uh, Mark 1, verse 16. I know you have little lines in there. So the first one is Mark 1, 16. And he mentions, who does he mention? Go to Mark 1, 16. Is that what I say? Yeah. yeah. Mark 1, 16. It's alive, but it's slow. All right. How does it read? As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Okay. So he addresses Simon, Simon is the first disciple mentioned. Now... The second scripture is Mark 16, 7. How does that read? And can you... Wow. That's not what I want. Oh, oh, oh. oh that's not what I want either. Oh, shut up. What's it say? Hmm. So go tell his disciples and Peter, and he is going before you to Galilee. Okay. There you will see. All right. So, do you know what the incidence is here? Yeah, the resurrection. So, the resurrection. Who's Jesus talking to? See, if you just look at that one verse, it's kind of hard to figure out. Okay. But Peter is singled out. All right, and that's the last, he's the last, or the only disciple that's mentioned. Who was Jesus talking to when, when he says, and he says, go tell the disciples and Peter. Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. And Mary, okay. the mother of James and Salome. Yeah, okay. Um, Peter is mentioned frequently. Oh, look at that. <coughs> Just in time for the bell. Well, James and I get another week off. I'm half tempted to leave this, uh, to leave the computer on or something. Um, Peter is mentioned frequently in Mark's gospel. Now, I was, I was doing a little research, and Mark mentions Peter 26 times compared to Matthew, who only mentions him three. All right? 
Uh, Peter is named by the church fathers. Now, to understand what's going on here, again, I had to do some digging. And uh, he had mentioned that um, with some of the writings, and that's how he knew that uh, um, Peter was mentioned, was uh, named as, as one of the church fathers through the historians. Um, now, Peter's embarrassments have been omitted. Can you think of some embarrassments? Well, they they cited as one of them was him walking on the sea. Okay, but that's I, one. That to me, that's not an embarrassment. Well, he was cur had enough courage to step out and to try. Well, yeah, but Jesus said, "Oh, ye," he says, "Why did you have? Why did you have little yeah. faith?" All right, uh, Mark fourteen, or excuse me, Matthew fourteen. 22 through 33 is the is the uh, example of, G, of Peter walking on the water. Okay, and if you the comparison is Mark 6 45 through 52. Go ahead and turn to that one. Run those by again, please. Um, yeah. Matthew 14 22 through 33, and then the Mark Mark's gospel is Mark 6 45 to 52. Did you copy that onto the desktop journal that probably would work faster? Oh, I was trying to get it because sometimes you can just drag it right over there. Yeah. Oh, look at that. I'm afraid to shrink it for fear of it. All right. In Matthew's gospel, what does Jesus say to Peter? Huh? What scripture you Your scripture went away. You're talking about the take heart in his eyes, do not be afraid. Well, near the end, when when he has to pull Peter out of the water. Oh, you have faith. Why did you have faith? Why did you doubt? Yeah, okay, in Mark's gospel, in Mark 6, 45 through 52, what does Jesus say? Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. That's all he says. That's all he says. Now, there are several, I had, I had several other ones on the PowerPoint, and, you know, those are my notes. So, uh, and if you look at... Uh, the way <laughs> things are happening, Joe. Things are happening, and that bell's gonna ring. Yeah, you got a couple minutes. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, we're gonna run through those real fast. All right, let's go to uh, Peter's knowledge has been included. Two passages, and and these are uh, what he says is they are um, they're minor. I mean, you can just slip right past them. The first one is Mark 11, 20 and 21. And then somebody turn to Mark 13, 1 through 4. I don't know why that's so slow. All right, what's the, what's the first one read? What was the first one? Mark 11, 20 and 21. <clears throat> it says, In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the root. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Okay. <laughs> Prior to that, Jesus cleansed the temple, right. and they went out. And then, uh, from what I understand, I don't think they were with Jesus because he said them to stay in the city. All right, here's here's that. But they one. traveled. That was what I can understand. They traveled back and forth to Bethany. They did to stay at Mary and Martha's house. Right. Lazarus. So they would have passed it, you know, going both directions. Mm -hmm. But when Jesus cursed the fig tree, were the disciples with him? We don't have any evidence of that. Peter must have known about it, though, because he asked Jesus about it. 
Hey! What? What happened? Yep, do it. That tree. <laughs> you know, and Jesus explained to it. Uh, what's Mark 13, 1 through 4 say? Then he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones. Am I the right place? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. What wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. All right, so Peter is actually, he's, he's actually, his, Peter's knowledge. Um, he's remembering through the Spirit what Jesus told him. I only got two verses. Do you want the other two? Yeah. <clears throat> and as he sat on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the signs when all these things are about to be accomplished? Okay. So again, some of this, Peter's knowledge, you know, it's, it's there, but it's minor. Uh, Peter's outline has been followed now this is with his preaching the first one is in acts 1 21 and 22 and the second one is acts 10 37 to 41 so acts 1 21 and 22 who has that I got it. okay so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Okay, now Acts 10, 37 through 41. Now I think this has to deal with the uh, with Cornelius. I think. <laughs> Acts 10, 37 to 41. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller. Bueller. Hmm. Want to read it? Please. I got it. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Um, Mark's gospel covers this. Peter does not go into <coughs> Jesus' private life. He, he covers the, the public things that he did. He doesn't even cover his birth. If you go into Mark's gospel, it starts with the baptism of John and then quickly goes into uh, Jesus' ministry, Jesus' baptism and then his ministry. And so these are things that Peter, that was the way Peter preached. All right. So here's our scripture reading for today. Dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be. <sighs> quick to listen. Slow to speak. We're just going to stop right there. Because we're, we're familiar with this script, scripture. It's James 1.19. All right? So, <clears throat> hanging on every word, listening is key in collecting evidence. Okay? Uh, let's see here. So, the key to listening is what's being said, how it's being said, words used or not used. And he, he, he said something about it pronouns and adjectives and things of that nature mm -hmm. and, and adverbs and how it's described. Okay? Now, so words are actually hey, come back here. Words are actually used as evidence. Alright? And, and every one of us has done that. We have used words as evidence, especially 
with our kids or with a co-worker who may have done something good or done something not so good. So here we have, I did not eat the chocolate. Oh, I did. Okay, so <laughs> we, we see I did not. So what does this statement say? Blame somebody else. <laughs> okay, I'm not the guilty one here. The chocolate's gone. I did not do it. Okay. Uh, and I, you know, what was it? Chocolate. The verb eat. The, yeah, if we figure it, it's gone. However, if you look at those <laughs> eyes, what do those eyes tell you? Now we're looking at, we're not only looking at the spoken word, we're looking at body language, we're looking at a lot of things. All right, what do those eyes tell you? I got caught. Yeah. All right, what do you think? Do they look innocent? I'm in trouble. They don't look innocent? No. I said it, no. I don't believe it. <laughs> okay, so then what evidence do we have? Do we have evidence that this kid didn't eat the chocolate? Just by those eyes? No. Not yet. He <laughs> would. Not yet. But what about that? Okay, so if the evidence is there. I didn't eat the... Why would a kid do that? I told you not to eat the chocolate. Why did you eat the chocolate? I don't know. Okay? By the way, we have cookies up here. Because, because it was there. Because it was there. Okay? So, we have evidence. I mean, it's, it's plain as... The chocolate on his face. On his face, his fingers, etc. Okay? So, active listening requires several skills. Okay, and those are it. Be attentive, ask open-ended questions. This is all part of communicating. And active listening, you know what? It's hard because what you're trying to do is you're listening, but you're trying to come up with something in, in return. You haven't heard what they said because you're thinking of what you're going to respond to. In active listening, you have to focus, okay? So you ask open-ended questions, you request re Request clarification, summarize for understanding or paraphrase, be attuned to their feelings. In other words, what are they saying to you or how are they looking? Um, watch your body language, that little boy, okay? And ask probing questions. It's all about asking and observing and listening. <clears throat> These are part of the tactics that we talk about, okay? Um, and the way to block that is to change the subject. All right, now let's look at this one. The Gospel of Mark deals with this, and, and we, we just covered all this, so I'm just going to, all right, wait a minute. I might have, there, that's, that's the one that I had. I had another one, Mark 8, 31 through 33. Go to that one, Mark 8, 31 through how does that read? And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he took this plainly, or he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. The turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you have not for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on the things of man. Okay. So, wait a minute. Go to Matthew 16, 21 through 30. 21 through 33. Just look at it real quickly and summarize. Because Jesus rebuked Peter in Mark. What's Matthew say? Matthew 6, 21 through 33. Well, he says, go ahead, Larry. Go ahead. Uh, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Okay. A little bit so, more harsher. A little, little harsher. All right. So. And Mark does not put that in there. And we've already covered these, these ones. So, 
Separate the artifacts from evidence. How <coughs> many of you know what this is? What is that? All too well. <laughs> okay, we know that's a it's an EKG. All right. Now, what is that? You sure? You sure it's an artifact? <laughs> Actually, it is. It is an artifact. The patient could have been moving. All right. But what is what is that? That's trouble. <laughs> yeah, you've probably seen that, right? Similar. <laughs> okay, that is actually uh, that is trouble. Yeah, that's ventricular tachycardia. Okay, yeah. and when we see that in medicine, break out the lidocaine. Okay. Uh, all right. What about this one? Is that artifact? No, that's shocking. No, no, no. <laughs> That's what that is. That's called V fib. All right. That is our artifact. The artifact is what's up top. So, so what's an artifact? Well, we're going to cover this real quick. Any object made by human beings, especially with a view to subsequent use. Examples, especially of manuscripts and writing. And, and we know what art. We've seen artifacts. All right. So here we go. Uh, we have a crime scene here. And uh, you see the evidence, you see one, two, it's a bottle, three is the, the, crime, the victim, four is a knife, five looks like there's a cup or a paper. But do you see any other artifacts in that picture? There's a blanket. Mm -hmm. There looks like a lampstand. Yeah. We have a pot, a planted pot, uh, books. And a cup. There's another cup. Could the planted pot be tested to see if it could be toxic to a human being? Well, it could be, but I think this crime scene might involve a knife or maybe pills. Because there's a few other artifacts on the table that are not listed. So, he was talking about getting rid of the artifacts. Alright? Do these artifacts add or change anything with the crime scene? Would a bookshelf change the... No. No. What about the blanket? No, Person's you. dead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the lampstand. No. No. Person's still dead. Oh, well, know. it depends It depends on the, the cause of death. Yeah. Right. It's another okay. thing. So, why are these manuscripts... Where are there artifacts in the manuscripts? Scribal editions for clarity, harmony, and detail are not clearly described by the apostle or the author. So when the scribes did it, they they added to and to clarify. What does that say about the, the thing that came to my mind? Is you shall not add or take away. Hmm. Oh, okay. Keep in mind what I asked about the artifacts in the crime scene. <clears throat> Some of the artifacts that he mentioned that aren't really in the original uh, writings is Jesus sweating blood, the angel coming down in his agony in the garden. That's not in the original manuscript. John, the angel stirring the waters. Okay. Uh, Acts, Silas decides to remain in Antioch. Okay. All right, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not going to be able to do that. So, those aren't in the, the original manuscripts. So, huh? The adulterous woman. Oh, the adulterous woman is not in the original manuscript. So, what is that? There are no original. No. Yeah. The earliest so we're gonna we're gonna I'll tell Jake that I got next week too. We're gonna cover this and finish up that chapter. And uh, if you want to look at conspiracy theories, do it. And maybe we'll I'll jump into that as well. And in the meantime, we're gonna figure out how we can. Uh, uh, do something about 
for the adult class. Well, remember, New Beginnings class, June 5th. All right? Thank you for your attention. Sorry about the technology.